Now, this is a massive effort. I mean, how does something like this even get rolled out, vaccines? I mean, do we train teachers to administer them? Does the military do it? Do we know what we're looking at yet as far as the rollout of this vaccine? That is the big question, right? And our work is just starting. Some vaccines require special training. I don't think this one will. So we probably can get pharmacists, of course, public health nurses, uh, family doctors to administer it. Maybe the military, if it comes to that. Um, it's going to be interesting. We, every year, we have this enormous flu vaccine distribution system. Right? So we do have the infrastructure for rapid, wide-scale vaccine delivery, but nothing at this scale. And the other challenge is that depending upon which formulation we go with, you may need special equipment to store and to transport it. So the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at very low temperatures. And I don't think most drugstores have the refrigeration capacity to store it at that temperature. So we may have to build and ship out refrigeration units, mobile refrigeration units, et cetera, to get to remote areas. Then there's a challenge of who gets it first. We do have a vaccine task force in Canada whose job it is to figure this stuff out, but I'm not sure exactly what they're doing or, or even who's on the, the task force, but they're supposed to figure out the, um, the logistics of it all. The, the, most people think that the people who should get it first are the healthcare workers, so doctors, nurses, ambulance drivers, anyone who's going to keep the system afloat. We don't want to take our best players off of the table, as it were. After that, I think we're probably going to see the most vulnerable get vaccinated, so the extreme elderly, the immunocompromised, and so forth. After that, probably people who are going to be exposed to a lot of other people, like school teachers and school bus drivers and transit operators. And after that, you know, then, then the rest of us get in line. So this is going to be a multi-month, if not years, endeavor, and it's going to be a while before we stop having masks and distancing as part of our daily norm. Mm. I mean, orchestrating, it sounds like a nightmare. I mean, two shots, three weeks apart is what I'm reading, 21 days apart. And you mentioned the flu vaccine, that we have the infrastructure there to administer it. But the shortage of the flu vaccine, I was talking to a pharmacist yesterday on the air. Uh, he has a waiting list of 250 people and growing. He said he's never had a waiting list ever before. Was that a bit, I don't know if disappointing is the right word, but just the fact that there was such a demand for the flu after everyone was promoting get the flu shot this year, and then we had a shortage. Is that kind of worrisome or any indication of how this could roll out? It's mind-boggling. Everybody knew this would be the biggest flu season ever. Everybody knew the demand would be extremely high. We've been advocating for 100% uptake for a long time, and yet we didn't acquire enough for a third of the province. Right? So that's a, a bit of a crazy level of planning there. I don't understand that. So yeah, it is worrying that we can't get the flu vaccine out fast enough, and that doesn't require a booster shot or special storage, or special skills. So the challenge is real. And the booster shot for COVID, right now we think you need uh, one booster shot in addition to the original shot for most of the formulations. You might need a third eventually, you know? You just don't know, right? So all, there are always unknowns in place. Now, other vaccines also require booster shots, like the shingles vaccine. Um, the main formulation, shingles, I think, requires a booster shot several months later. So it's not atypical. It's just an added complication in your life. A further complication is that there's something like a glass shortage in the world right now, believe it or not. So we have a hard time getting glass ampules to store and ship vaccines. Wow. Now, the federal government was forward thinking many months ago and acquired sufficient syringes and cotton swabs for 35 million doses. Right? So that's at least that's some forward thinking, not having a yeah. vaccine, at least get the stuff you can get. Yeah. But we're going to be, there's going to be a global battle to get the stuff that we need. And I'm hoping that there is a, a you know, a, a wide scale effort to retask manufacturing centers to make vaccine rather than you know, SUVs and maybe use our, our existing delivery infrastructure instead of shipping out uh, Coca-Cola, we can ship out vaccines. So there, there are possibilities here. Right. A lot of room for error too. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be alarmist and zero sarcasm when I ask this, but I, uh, what could go wrong? <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? It's, it's a scary yeah. question to ask. Yeah, of course, it is a new vaccine. And of course, there's going to be side effects. That's unavoidable, especially given the very large number of people who are going to take it. If it's a 0.01% probability of something bad happening, well, if 100 million people get this vaccine, that's a large number of people who are going to have adverse reactions. So right now, with the Pfizer vaccine, there are no serious adverse reactions reported. And by serious, we mean things requiring hospitalization, things causing death, things causing disability. 
but it's still early days. And it, probably someone's going to have a bad reaction. We have to brace ourselves for that. That's not avoidable. But the, the high probability is that for most of us, it will be extremely safe. And for, for those for whom it isn't, we have to have the medical capacity to, to treat them and to care for them. And hopefully, as the data unfolds, we can better predict who is more likely to react poorly. Right? Because um, one of the other aspects of these trials is that we're not trying it on extremely elderly or extremely young. We don't know if children under 12 can tolerate it. We don't know if uh, people over 80 will develop an immunogenic response. So there's a lot of unknowns still, um, but that is the nature of the game, of the new technology. And it took a while for other vaccines to, to find their stride. It's going to take a few years for this one as well. But I'm excited by it, and I, I will be first in line to get any vaccine that passes the necessary safety protocols as laid out by FDA and Health Canada. I think those are sufficient for me and my family, and therefore probably for everybody else. I'm with you on that. I would be first in line as well for this, obviously prioritizing. But uh, do you think they're going to make this mandatory? I do not see it being made mandatory. I don't see any public tolerance for it. We can't even make you know economic restrictions mandatory. We can't get people to wear masks half the time. So I don't think there would be a public tolerance for mandatory vaccine. What we might see is you need a vaccine to do certain things. So it's a backdoor kind of mandatoriness. You need a, you know, a vaccine to get a, a job in a certain sector to attend school in person, possibly. Yeah. So those are things I wouldn't be surprised by. Uh, prevention and quarantine, I mean, that seems to be the, the biggest way to stop it kind of before it starts spreading. Uh, do you think... I know you don't have a crystal ball, so you can't really tell, but can it ever be controlled fully, a virus like this? Can a vaccine eradicate it, or do you think this might be something that we're just going to be living with, kind of like the flu? Eradication is always on the table, but it's hard. I mean, some criteria are needed for something to be easily eradicated. Among them, you need a natural reservoir, which is human beings. A natural reservoir is the animal in which the disease lives normally. So smallpox, it lives in humans. So if you get rid of it in humans, it can't go anywhere else. Right? This probably lives in bats and other animals, too. So that, that makes it hard. Second, it, it's nice if natural infection leads to recovery, leads to lifelong immunity. That's the case with smallpox. That's not the case here. Third, it's nice if you have a vaccine that is well tolerated by everybody and that confers lifelong immunity, like we have with smallpox, that we don't have here. So smallpox had a lot of advantages for eradication, hence we were able to eradicate it. This disease, it's significantly harder. It doesn't mean it's not possible. It, it is possible if every, the entire world goes into hard lockdown and everyone gets the, the vaccine and we do some other you know, uh, interesting biotechnological things. So it is possible, but it's unlikely. What's more likely to happen? is that we live with it like the flu, like you said, uh, having a yearly vaccine, and we watch it mutate to nothingness. Um, some people think the Spanish flu mutated to less lethality. That might be the way this one goes, because there is a, um, an environmental evolutionary pressure to mutate in that direction, to a direction that does not kill your host. Right. I mean, you might have even answered this question. It, do we know if this is going to be like a you get this vaccine once and that's all you need? Or is it going to be a yearly type thing? Or do we know that yet? I think it's highly likely that it will be a yearly endeavor, kind of like the flu shot. And with the flu shot, we have 40% uptake, and that seems to be sufficient for most of the population. And in the future, probably if the vulnerable get the vaccination, then that's probably good enough. And do you think, one more question for you, do you think once we have this vaccine, it is, it is out there, it's being administered, and they're working their way down the those who are prioritized for it, do you think that's when we're really going to start to see some of these restrictions being being loosened now that there is an active vaccine out there? So the vaccine is a bright light at the end of a dark tunnel. The tunnel is long, and um, getting herd immunity by the vaccine is the goal, and that means 70-80% of people getting getting vaccinated. But you can lower that threshold if people are still wearing masks and distancing and limits on gatherings. So as we inch towards that herd immunity threshold, these other restrictions can come down incrementally. I anticipate we'll still be wearing masks and distancing well into next fall. But by the beginning of 2022, those things will start to fall away. And when we have the saturation of the vaccine by the end of 2022, I think everything will be open. Excellent. So really, like you said, the tunnel, is, it's a long one, but there is a light at the end, which is a great thing to focus on. But the biggest hurdle seems to be right now uh, just figuring out a way to get this out there, to get, make it accessible to people. 
Well, the biggest hurdle right now is getting the safety data, making sure everyone right. agrees this is the one we want, and then waiting for the other candidates to arrive. So we have a variety of candidates we can deploy, then figuring out how to deploy it. Right. Uh, Dr. Rewat, Diamandin, uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.